from Microbe TV. This is Twin This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 26, recorded on January 18th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from San Francisco, Ori Lieberman. Hi, Vincent. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. I'm glad to be back. I think it's been a couple episodes. Yep. We missed you. Yeah. Good to it's have like you. It's like doing a residency is hot or something, huh? Oh, my God, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, nice to have a couple days uh, to myself. It's good. <laughs> Yesterday, you were in jeopardy, right? Yeah, so I was on backup call and, uh, you know, there's, I guess there's this concept in residency about white cloud and black cloud about your luck of how busy you are. So I have yeah. a white, I have a white cloud. I'm, my work hours are much lower compared to everyone else. And I have had much fewer, many fewer patients. So I didn't get called all weekend and I came off at 7 p.m. last night. And the person who came on got called at 645 for two night shifts in a row. So the white wow. cloud continues. Yeah. Also joining us from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Hey, Ron. Hey, Jason. Happy How's New Year. Going? Yep. Happy New Year. And from, from here in New York, Tim Chung. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Uh, I just want to say I don't want to be treated by a doctor who's been up for two days uh, under a black <laughs> cloud. So I'm not, not going to San Francisco. I don't think you have a choice because yeah, that's the way it is no everywhere. You know, it's that's the way it is everywhere. This is rite of passage. They think that the more deprived you are, the better. <laughs> I don't get it. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Vivian Morrison, welcome. Thank you very much. Good to see you guys again. It's also been a few months for me, I think, a few episodes. All right. So was, uh, well, as soon as Ori comes back, we put him to work, right? <laughs> Well, I figure while I'm here, I might as well uh, push an agenda, I guess. <laughs> I think, yeah, I've vol already volunteered this one. He did. So he has himself to blame. But it's a, it's a really fun paper, so I'm looking forward to this. Well, I mean, um, the, the twin was Ori's idea, so it's good that he volunteered, right? <laughs> yeah, pick up, pick up my, uh, my end of the bargain. Yeah. What do we have today, Ori? Okay, so we have a... I think there's a theme of the papers that I lead, um, but we have another uh, neuroimmune crosstalk paper um, building on other papers that we have worked on. So the title of the paper is uh, Insular Cortex Neurons Encode and Retrieve Specific Immune Responses. Uh, it was published in Cell. The first author is Tamar Koren. Last is Asya Rolls. Um, and it's a very interesting paper. I would say it's provocative. It lays out... Uh, interesting ideas. I think that there, there are a lot of questions that I had about it. Um, and the basic question, um, or let me, let me start with a question for you all. Um, have you ever been, had something that, uh, made you nervous? Your first, a first date, uh, your job talk. Never. No, I've, and I've never been had, nervous <laughs> ever. And had the tummy troubles. Oh, as a consequence of being nervous? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have felt nausea. Okay. I, can, I, can, yes. I can only reverse engineer and think that I'm nervous all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I certainly have. And I think that, um, you know, there's, a, there's I certainly um, feel a connection between the brain and the gut. Um, and one question is, um, how is this, how, how is kind of gut activity and gut function and gut inflammation controlled by the CNS? Um, and another kind of side point to that is that people with uh, inflammatory disorders that undergo stress um, can have exacerbations of their disease. Um, and we, we don't really understand the mechanisms for this. Um, and I think that there have been kind of correlative uh, studies where they show, for example, that certain parts of the brain are activated um, during exacerbations of inflammation or during um, kind of an inflammatory response. Um, but understanding how the neurons are activated, when the set of neurons are activated, are they able to then invoke, like to create that inflammatory response was unknown before this paper. Um and this paper uses a lot of kind of tools that we've spoken about. Um, and 
bridges the gap from this like kind of vague association of the brain and inflammation um, to essentially a deep neuroscience concept of the memory engram. Um, so Jason, I'll call on you. Can you can you explain to me what a memory engram is? Right. Yeah. So we, as a reminder, um, you know, science has been searching for what that physical substrate of memory is in the brain. So that that could be something that is literally physical, so changes in anatomy, or it could be changes in functional connectivity between cells. So um, the idea that the the main sort of um, idea we have now is that there's a certain set of, of neurons that are active during training or during the uh, experience that's being recorded, and they get wired up together either through that anatomical change or through plasticity so that they're, con they're more connected later on. And when you recall that memory, you just need to recall a part of that engram or ensemble of cells uh, to recall the full, the full memory. Um, but there's a lot of debate of what that engram actually looks like. And for now, we'll just say it's a, it's a specific set of ensemble or, or cells that are connected in some way. Through magic that I think we've yet to determine. Um, so, and why do, why did these authors think that an immune response, um, could have a memory and like could uh, be encoded in a memory engram or a memory in the brain? So there are, they actually reference old work, which I thought was really, really cool, um, called immune conditioning. Um, and in these experiments, they could essentially pair sugar water um, with an immune response, with an in, like an inflammatory stimulus. And then if they later gave the animal just the sugar water, they could, inv they could create the inflammatory stimulus without giving them any sort of inflammation. Mind, it's complete, mind blowing. It's complete. Right? It's complete. My, mind blowing. And th this has a very strong analogy to many different types of memory that we've talked about on this podcast uh, about fear memories and emotion and kind of like valence. And, you know, we, I, we can go through all the episodes that we've mentioned memory on the podcast. But here we're talking about instead of a memory of the, your surroundings or a memory of an experience, we're talking about a memory of the immune response itself. Okay. And so how do they go about figuring out whether there is an engram that encodes this immunologic experience? Okay. So um, they have two different paradigms. And in these paradigms, they uh, induce inflammation in mice. Um, so, and what's interesting is that these are organ specific inflammation syndromes, I'll call them. Um, so in one, they give essentially an irritant to the mice in their drinking water that creates inflammation in the colon called colitis. And in the second, they inject another irritant into the area around the abdominal organs called the peritoneal space that causes inflammation in the peritoneum or kind of the lining of the abdominal organs. So you have either a, cyst, a uh, syndrome or a kind of a group where there's inflammation within the colon or in a group where there's inflammation in just the lining of the organs of the abdomen. Okay. All right. Can I, <clears throat> sure. sorry, can I characterize, is it fair to characterize it as the first one, which is the colitis model as uh, inflammation and swelling inside the colon and the second one, which is the per peritonitis yeah, uh, as as inflammation outside the colon, like on the opposite end, on, on the outside, inside the kind of the stomach wall, so to speak, or gut wall. Yeah, I think, wall. I think that we can take a step back to think about what what the anatomy is of these abdominal organs, right? So, so if you think about it, your the connection from your mouth to your butt is just a series of tubes, right? And these tubes um, on the inside is actually the outside world, okay? And then surrounding these tubes is a layer of something called uh, peritoneum in the gut, which is essentially like a like a cellular layer that then um, has a is a, is back to back with another layer. So you have a tube, a layer that's like embedded on the outside of the tube, and then a, a space which is actually what is called like a potential space. So it doesn't really exist unless something fills it, and then a second layer of encasement. So when you are injecting the irritant into the peritoneum you're injecting it between these two spaces and then you create irritation in the spaces and um, you can have irritation or infection in that space in a number of different human diseases. 
But the idea is actually kind of, in some ways, you could just imagine there's inflammation in one part of the body in one group and inflammation in another part of the body in the other group. Because their question in using these two different models is whether um, the brain encodes just a high inflammation state or whether the brain encodes an inflammation state within a particular organ. And that's actually quite a quite a different uh, in a different way that this kind of uh, neural circuit could work. A series of tubes, just like the internet. Yes, and <laughs> Al, Al Gore Bull created and the gut as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah is, it, is the internet a mouth and or the other? <laughs> um, know, one question that I had, even as we before we get into the details, you know, the we've known that the insular cortex, which is the part of the brain that really um, can can um, sense, taste, and guess you know gastronomy, gastronomy in, in in general. So you know, um, one would predict that if the animal is feeling sick and nauseous, that's going to activate the insula no matter what. And I don't know how you can divorce that kind of sensory information that's internal, but it's all sensory information. Like we we all know when we feel sick, right? Uh, how are you going to be able to divorce that from immune um, changes when they're both happening at the same time? So that's, I think, maybe a question to have at the end. But yeah. So I think that they, I think so. Let's let's take a step back and talk about kind of the first experiment they that they do, which is that they induce colitis or inflammation in the colon, and then they look at what parts of the brain are activated during this inflammation. Okay. Um, and they get a number of different areas of the brain, some that we've talked about already, for example, like the amygdala or the hypothalamus. And this makes sense. The brain is encoding kind of a negative valence of this inflammation period. Um, and then importantly, they, uh, they identify that the insular cortex, which Jason just mentioned, um, is activated. And so what is the insular cortex? So the insular cortex, um, as Jason mentioned, uh, receives a lot of interoceptive signals. So if you think about the sensory cortex, um, the sensory cortex receives touch and, and vision um, and smell, right, from the outside world and represents our kind of external senses. The insular cortex, in, as, like on the opposite, actually uh, receives signals from um, sensory neurons that line the gut um, and can essentially uh, give us the sense of our internal organs. Um, and that can be either pain or temperature or discomfort or nausea, as Jason said. Um, and I, I think I, I met someone in a meeting once who called the insular, insular cortex the seat of the soul. Because as you can imagine, if your insular cortex is unhappy, the, the rest of the brain could be unhappy as well. Okay. I don't think um, classroom was the seat of the soul, but no, I had it. Seat of that's consciousness. consciousness. That's consciousness. That's, yeah. so, so in consciousness, it's very different. Apparently. I think the person who told me that was uh, was uh, studied the insular cortex, so I uh, there was a small conflict of interest. I would say. Um, but, uh, if you go to if you go to Wikipedia and look up insular cortex, it literally does everything. It, it's just completely nuts. Which means that we don't understand what it does. It means that we completely don't understand it. Like it goes everything from like feeling your own heartbeat to like. St- being able to carry on a conversation, to like having spiritual uh, spiritual uh, uh, epiphany. So yeah. So oh, why is it why is it insular? Uh, I guess because it only responds to internal sensations, right? I think insular okay. is no, from actually, I, I think that's an anatomical. No that's an anato- anatomical that's reason. That's the insular thought. capsule is a bunch of white matter that comes through, and I think it's just defined by the boundaries of this white matter and mm. it's an insular tract. Hmm. So I'm looking at this picture of the mouse. It seems to be a very small part of the entire cortex, right? Near the center, roughly. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. It, yeah, it's, I mean, it's probably not to scale, but it's it's actually a fairly large part of the cortex. Um, okay. But yeah, and now it's, and you know, you know, one of the things we know for sure that is important um, for the that the insulin is important for is when you have a conditioned taste aversion paradigm. So you condition, you basically um, sub- subject an animal to a taste. Let's put a pair of sugar with some. You lace it with something that that is very bitter or makes it toxic. That the animal associates with something that used to be a reward to now to be something that's not good. Um, if you take out the insular cortex or you block the insular cortex, 
that conditioning does not happen at all. So we've known for a while that you really need the insulas uh, for this kind of um, association that results from the animal feeling sick. So broccoli aversion, you take out the insular cortex and no problem now, right? (laughs) Well, if, you yeah, put, I, if you put I, sugar, I, I, cheese-coated so. broccoli. <laughs> That's right. But then the child would no longer have a soul, so it's a difficult <laughs> trait. Interesting. Uh, so, and so they focus on the insular cortex because uh, other work had shown essentially that lesions of the insula eliminates immune conditioning and a lot of kind of the neuroimmune control that it, that has been seen in the past. Um, so, so in this initial kind of screen, they saw that many parts of the brain were activated by the immune response. Um, but then they tra- kind of transition their paradigm. And what they do is they say, what are, whether are there neurons within the insula that are part of a, uh, memory engram that are formed during the immune response. Okay. So they inject a uh, virus, uh, into the insular cortex and this insular cortex or this, excuse me, this virus, um, expresses something called a fast trap system. So um, we've talked about uh, this a little bit before, but um, when neurons are activated, uh, they express a specific set of genes called immediate early genes, one of which is called uh, FOS or CFOS. Um, and what uh, biologists have done or neuros- neuroscientists have done over the last 10 years has created a system where um, you can essentially express um a way to mark certain cells that ex- that are synthesizing FOS or trying to synthesize FOS during a particular period. And we kind of can skip the details of, of this tool itself, except to say that now when they um, give a second drug, so it's essentially like a one, it's a, a dual lock system. When they give a second drug, they then say any cells that are active during that period where the second drug is present are now marked forever, essentially. Um, and then it basically just tags the cells during a particular window of experience. Jason, as always expressing it much more clearly. So, (laughs) but, but the trick is that then they can tag these cells, both just with fluorescent markers. So they know which cells they are, but also with other tools that could manipulate their activity down the line. Okay. So what they're doing is they essentially take mice They express this system. They then cause the inflammation. They tag the cells that are active during the inflammation. Then much later on, manipulate their activity to see whether that could reinduce the same immune phenotype in the gut and whether it can cause gut inflammation in and of itself. Okay. So, um, the, I think the caveat of this experiment, which I am interested to see what you guys all thought, was that they they focused on the insula in these experiments. In some ways, it would have been interesting to see whether, and I guess the, the point is that they were actually not able to recapitulate the whole immune response, and we'll talk about the details in a second, but they excluded the function of all the other parts of the brain that are involved in this immunologic memory when they reactivate only the insula. Um, and that that is kind of an interesting question of why they chose that. Um, actually, yeah. there's another interesting part of this, which is that they only concentrated on the right cortex. Right. Um, I didn't know this, that, that there is supposedly lateralization of the insula, which means it's in only human. doing something on one side of the hemisphere. And this is in a mouse. So I actually don't know a lot of lateralizations in the mouse. In humans, of course, we always talk about this part of the left-hand side of the brain versus right-hand side of the brain. Although I think that a lot of that's not as clear as, hocus, as yeah. some say. Did you say hocus pocus? I, I was I was I was deciding between saying hokum versus hocus pocus, and then I <laughs> came out with hocus. Because okay. so. I think there are some components that are clearly lateralized, but then when people start talking about oh, you're like uh, you know critical thinking side of your brain versus like your arts side of your brain, that's where things really fall apart. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I had never really thought about this in terms of lateralization in the mouse, and I thought that was an interesting experimental trick that they used. The only question I had was, I'm surprised that the reviewers didn't ask them to do a cohort of mice where they injected both choruses and at least see whether there is an engram on the other side as well. 
But what they showed was in this experiment that um, cells that were tagged as active during the ex- during the uh, initial inflammation, if they were activated later on, it changed the inflammatory phenotype of the gut. And you know, so they they the um, the colitis model that they use has been very well studied and there are many, many different phenotypes that happen. For example, there are different uh, T cell subsets that are activated. Um, there are different dendritic cell subsets that are activated. And then of course there is all of kind of the changes in the organ itself. So there's um, inflammation, there's change in colon length, um, there's colon transit time changes. So they then asked by just activating this subset of cells, the memory, quote unquote, engram in the insular cortex, could they recapitulate that inflammatory syndrome? And they found that there were a subset of things that they could recapitulate. So for example, um, different sets of T cells were activated. There were different distributions of uh, of immune cells between uh, different layers of the mucus, mucosal layers of the um, colon. What they didn't show was that they could recapitulate kind of the histological changes or the gross organ changes that were seen when they when they in actually induce inflammation um, in the first place. And this is uh, how long? It's four hours of reactivation, right? Or is that four days? I think. Yeah, four days. Oh yeah, sorry, four days. But, but I don't know what. Like, but I'm guessing it's. Do you know, or do you know how the how they activated it via this drug, this designer drug called CNO to activate the engram? Is it in drinking water or is it injected once a day? I so I, I believe it's injected. I don't know how many days mm-hmm. they when they injected it or how frequently because they. Um, one second, I'll tell you. In it's, a yeah, because in, yeah. in the schematic it says from zero to four days, they the mice have this designer drug given to them that would just specifically activate the engram. Um, so it's not the best time to look for it. Yeah. So this but, and this is a, a well worked there, out system now. Um, the only thing that such. so it was it was done at at twenty four hour intervals. So essentially, they got four individual injections of CNO. I mean, the to get into the weeds, there theoretically then should be er- periods of time during these four days when the when the dreads are not active, when these cells are not being artificially activated, um, which may or may not have impacted the the result of the experiment. Um, I think of what the half life of CNO is, but I think it's pretty long. So. You know, you're you're getting at least half a day of activity after injection, and I think that they probably did this on purpose because if you overactivate these dreads, you can actually have like neuronal toxicity and stuff like that. So you could imagine that constant activation of the dreads over four days would be would kill off the insular cells in some way, or could have a kind of a bad effect. Um, so. So they essentially partially recapitulated their phenotype and they certainly were able to recapitulate a lot of the immunologic signature, even if they couldn't recapitulate the organ damage itself. Um, although, and Which kind so, of makes sense, right? Like there's got to be something that is locally responding to the toxin or the irritant that, the irritant that causes colitis itself and not everything is just immunologic. I don't, I don't know enough about this. I'm just wondering whether you guys think... I mean, and the well, the other thing is like that. Of course, it is. Uh, this is an artificially induced model of colitis, right? So, in the real world, uh, inflammatory bowel disease is not necessarily triggered by something that's artificially given to patients, right? Um, there are kind of acute exacerbations of the illness. There's not necessarily a trigger that's found. Um, and I think one question that these authors are are kind of provoking us to think about is whether this is centrally activated inflammation, um, and whether the, the acute exacerbations that are seen in humans could be mediated by kind of the immune engram being reactivated in our brains. I don't think that they've shown oh, that here. Like as in without any environmental exactly, triggers. Exactly, exactly. Except for just internal you know, yeah, stress or yeah. something. I thought that one thing that would have been interesting to do would have been to um, do essentially a second round of stimulating the colitis, but with a lower dose of the trigger of the stimulant with activation of the engram and show that essentially that a dose of the this DSS was insufficient in mice that to, to cause colitis in mice where the insular cortex wasn't activated, whereas in mice where the insular cortex was activated, you could essentially predispose them to have the immune response. But instead they they did they did this experiment without any immune activation like in and of itself except via the the insular cortex. Hmm. 
So if you infected a mouse with a virus and then activated the neurons, would you get inflammation in the absence of the virus? I mean, I think that 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 is the question, right? Because here, both of these uh, models of inflammation are sterile inflammation, right? So yeah. there's no infectious organism. Um, and I, th I I don't think that, that we know that ans the answer to that question. Although um, one of our earlier podcasts, we discussed how um, B and T cell maturation and kind of antibody responses were changed um, by innervation of the spleen. Mm, um, yeah. But in that case, we didn't. L they didn't show whether that was, um, they could generate better protection. They just showed that the antibody maturation was different. Um, so are, li are, are, are lymph nodes also innervated besides the spleen? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Um, so, so then they transition to this other model of, uh, of inflammation. So it, they go from the colitis to pneumonitis, or sorry, uh, uh, peritonitis. Um, so, and they essentially recapitulate what they showed in the colitis model in the peritonitis model. And then they ask the question of if they activate the insular cortex engram that is formed during the peritonitis, so inflammation of the lining of the abdomen, do they induce inflammation within the colon itself or is it specific to the lining of the abdomen? And they actually show that it's organ specific. So th that is actually like a pretty interesting idea that you're not, when you activate this ensemble, you're not just creating kind of this hyper inflammatory state that's generalized, but you're creating an organ specific inflammatory signature. Yeah, all with an insula. It's completely nuts. Right. It's like, so you know how like, if you look at some, um, if you look at some uh, uh, neuroscience textbook it, and you look at how the brain organizes itself in the sensory cortex, you will see this thing called a homunculi where every single bit of your body is represented. But it, sound, it looks like, from, like based on face value from this paper, every bit of your internal organ is represented inside, perhaps represented inside the insula, at least the immunologi immunological internal organ separately but they, represented. But then they try to address that. So, so if it's like the homunculus, then you would expect cells one through five would be activated in response to inflammation in the peritoneum and cells six through 10 would be activated in response to inflammation within the colon. But they actually show that in repeated inflammations in the peritoneum, they activate different subsets of cells within the insular, the insular cortex. So, so, so um, go ahead. But one, maybe I'm missing this, but the, the mouse they're using is a, is a, um, is a CFOS, it's a trap mouse. And so mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they can restrict the expression or the trapping to the insular cortex. They use a viral vector that expresses the FOS trap only in the, in the right insular cortex. But this is so where I'm like, huh, did they show that? Did they show like the virus really just only hitting the insula and how many oh. cells they got? And sure, um, yeah, I mean that's that's going to be tough, especially since AAV sometimes can jump. Yeah, I mean that's kind of the, I guess that's the challenge of modern day neuroscience with viral injections. And I know something that, for example, like Tim has thought a lot about of of how you can get specificity in the striatum, for example. Um, by injecting viruses and are, there are different a AAV subtypes that can kind of spread more or less. Um, I, yeah, I don't have, I don't have the answer to that question, Jason. Um, I, I think the experiment that you proposed of just doing this in the left uh, insular cortex would have been a nice control, but. Um, or yeah, or showing that another brain region that was activated with during this immune, during the colitis was insuff like was insufficient to drive the inflammatory response. So right. for example, like you could imagine that one of the regions that was activated was um, one of the sensory, the supplement, like um, S2 essentially, the one of the um, sensory cortices that shouldn't necessarily uh, send out kind of efferent pathways to control the immune response. So it would have been nice to show that they could activate the sensory cortex or they could trap essentially the engram in the sensory cortex, but not activate the peripheral immune response by activating right. that. They did, they did some, a little bit of that control experiment that you suggested, Jason, in the first bit where they did um, the colitis. So originally, the, the main experiment they 
uh, use activity dependent trapping of the engrams that is in response to the colitis and then they subsequently activated those cells without the irritant anymore and it causes all this irritable uh, inflammation disease then they did a control where they expressed the same designer receptors in the insular cortex which actually activated even more cells but it's a random collection of cells within the insular cortex right. and when they did that the mouse didn't do anything there's no inflammation so they suggest their, interp their interpretation is that you have to kind of really target your activation to just the engrams for you to get the inflammation. And if you just randomly select, you know, random collection of insular cells, you don't get the inflammation. Right. So that's one potential control that they did. Right. And then they, they also trapped cells before or after the inflammatory response. And they showed that those trap cells, which theoretically should be some random collection as opposed to the engram itself, don't are insufficient to drive it, to drive the immune but, response. But Ori, coming coming back to your point about uh, them looking, kind of trapping the engrams in the insula that responded to the peritonitis, so the second experiment, and then redoing the peritonitis, but this time looking at FOS activation. So looking at the second engram and see if it's the same kind of cells. The, the researchers found that there's very little overlap. So if you, if, you, if you assume there's an engram, then the same kind of cell should be activated every single time, right? Well, but, but it, yeah, but I think that like, I think that, I mean, I, I, I certainly am not an expert in this literature, which I think is vast and conflicting, but I think like what, many of these groups have shown is that the that cells are recruited to engrams based on like their intrinsic excitability and kind of synaptic activity at that moment so you could imagine that that if three cells all receive the same inputs and cell one is more excitable during the initial inflammatory insult that will be recruited to an engram for that one and then uh, an, uh, you know, another cell is act is more excitable during the second event, and that gets recruited to the second event. And I don't think it's necessarily that um, that that it's not like the homunculus, where the same set of cells are going are dependent on like based on like anatomical inputs. Right. I was just gonna I was just gonna say we have actually seen this before on twin, where uh, a while ago we we looked at a paper talking about the olfactory representational drift in the mm. piriform cortex. And in that, in that paper, the experimenter gave the same smell to the mouse over and over again and recorded from the smell cortex. And they saw this, the neurons that are activated, even though it's the same smell, it kind of moved around and it went to different neurons. So it could very well be the same thing again for this case. Yeah, I mean, the key, the key here is that the initial trapping, you know, whether those cells stay as the engram ultimately is not clear, but, but initially for sure. in the first few days, um, they're the, the cells that are undergoing consolidation or they're doing something. I think the key here, um, to know is what are the downstream connections between mm. those cells and the peripheral nervous system and the gut. And I think this is where there's a complete black box because we've ignored the enteric nervous system. We've been, there's, the gut is surrounded by these cell, these neurons, and it's almost like its own nervous system. And we know nothing about them because we just ignored them. Um, and even now, after you know all this microbiome stuff and but you know all these diseases that seem to maybe initiated maybe initiated in the gut, uh, we still don't know what those enteric nervous system cells are actually encoding. So, but the fact that there seems to be some specificity is, as you say, nuts. Like that there's some sort of, um, either it's new specificity, so those cells that are trapped develop um, new connections to the gut, um, or there's some sort of predispo predisposition for those cells to, to undergo activity during um, the, the inflammation. I, I I think that so they they kind of do this experiment where they trace the they essentially inject a retrograde tracing virus into the gut and then they trace it back to the insula. But if I'm not mistaken, that I had I was not going to bring this up because I was a, a little bit unimpressed by the experiment because I like I thought it was there's a lot to go into and they kind of just barely touched on it. But if I remember correctly, that in this experiment, it was didn't correlate with whether a cell was going to be in like the 
direct connection between the gut and the insular cortex did not correlate with whether that cell in the insular cortex was going to be part of the engram or not. Right. And well, I think it correlated. I think it was it was correlating. But there were a lot of cells that were not connected, right? But I think yeah. there are more. It certainly doesn't Sorry, have I, to be a direct connection either. I no. mean, who knows what the intermediary is? Um, um, as an aside, you know, these papers, we've talked about this before in, in papers where often, you know, there's big claims made and then you actually analyze the data and you're like, uh, uh, maybe that's not that strong. Cell has, or Cell Press has introduced this um, limitations of mm -hmm. study of the study section at the end of the paper, which I really like because it sort of allows the authors to potentially downplay or at least say, okay, we're not hundred percent sure. So just here's, here's our alternatives. Um, and they do say, you know, it's possible that the information being encoded is really just sensory input from the gut. It's not, it's not the immune, it's not the specific immune um, information. So, Ori, your problem is that when they put the, the, the pseudorabies in, the tracer, it labeled more cells than the insular cells? Is that what you're yeah, saying? I mean, I don't think it's a problem. I think that the biology is just more complicated than that. I think that there's there's always lateral connections between yeah, neurons yeah, sure. in, the, in the cortex. And, like, it doesn't have to work one-to-one. -one. And if you – I mean, I, I, I like Jason's point about the enteric nervous system, but I also wonder whether, you know – Yes, there is direct sensation and direct activation of different things in the gut via the ENS. But where are the kind of higher order computations happening? Presumably in the insular cortex. And the second part of that is that these computations we we don't understand. So the fact that it would be one-to-one -one would be very surprising to me because mm -hmm. then it would kind of leave out the question of where these higher order computations are happening. Um, I So I, I thought that so first of all, I, I really like the limitations of the study um, section. I, I wanted to use the last few minutes of this paper, of discussion of this paper, to talk about what we learned in this paper compared to what we knew before the paper. And Sorry, I think that, you did, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I don't know whether we have time, but I was just going to quickly, I was wondering, like for the, I was somewhat interested in the tracing study because I thought that would have provided some mechanistic underpinning of why you have different and potentially n-grams, but they didn't do the experiment that exactly. would, I kind of envision, which is having two different pseudorabies, one inside the colon and one in the abdomen, and show that they go to different populations in the insula. I was, I'm sorry, I seem to have jumped your point. All right, no, so back, back to you. No, no, that, no, 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 that, that wasn't actually my point, but that, that, was a, that would have been a very nice experiment. To me, this felt like a... Um, it's felt like an attempt at a mechanism that they didn't have space to go into. And I'm sure that they're working on the follow-up, but it, it felt like a, it was kind of like to the, like orthogonal to the paper itself and what, what the point was. But so maybe what we can do is, and I think that, I think that this paper is really useful to play this game that I think that we as scientists play when we read papers, which is what do we learn? How did the author sell the data? Okay, so so we can just look at the title: insular cortex neurons encode and retrieve specific inter immune responses. So I think that they have proven that to me. So um, they certainly encode them in the sense that if you take cells that were activated during the experience, you can recreate at least part of the experience, and it's specific in that it's organ specific at least, right? So I, I buy the title, but I'm, then I'm if not we I'm not convinced okay. though. I'm not convinced that the 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 cortex is encoding in, in, inflammatory in actual inflammatory info. Mm -hmm. It's it's a generalized response that may be organ specific, but I don't know if the, there's uh, inflammation information here. And I think that they, they that I agree with you. And part of that is that they actually they mention that first of all they only recapitulate a subset of the immune phenotype. And some of their findings are actually in the opposite direction of what the tr the actual colitis model showed. Um, and then just to go back to your earliest point of, you know, what other interoceptive signals could this be encoding when they use acetaminophen or Tylenol to block pain, they actually change kind of what the engram can do. So it's clearly encoding more than the immune response. It's encoding the pain that's associated with it and probably the nausea and other things. But I... I I wanted to get to the point of what do we know before this paper? And they, they write a very nice introduction. They go through papers from the seventies from the, actually there's a couple of reference or a reference from the 1800s. 
Okay. Um, and what we knew from my reading of these papers is that if we lesion the insular cortex, we can affect the immune res- the, c- the central control of the immune response. Did we learn more than that in this paper? By effect, you mean ablate it? Yeah. So if we take, if we take, so in the, it, for before we had these fancy viruses, okay, we could lesion larger areas of the brain without cell type spe- specificity um, with chemicals. And that essentially just creates a large scar in the insular cortex. And depending on how good your injections are, you are lesioning a bigger or smaller area of the brain, okay? Um, and this was work that showed the role of the amygdala and fear conditioning and many things. And now we're adding to that with our cell type specificity and kind of our more elegant markers. But I, in this paper where they don't have cell type specificity, their engram in co- is included in both GABA and glutamatergic, includes both GABA and glutamatergic neurons. Okay. It's one region specific. Um, I just wonder what we learned more. And I, I, I hope that you guys can, can point things out to me. It's the engram. It's the fact that there's an en- there's a organ specific engram or compartment specific engram. I'm I'm not quite sure which one it is. Like inside the colon versus in the, in the abdomen abdominal space. Yeah. Um, it might not be a specific immunological memory, but it might be a generalized activation of the immune system for the for that organ for whatever reasons I don't know. But I think that is somewhat interesting that. You can uh, a a person can have uh, an organ specific targeting um, of the immune response from the brain. I thought that. I mean, I I could yeah, not. Uh, I would agree with Tim. That. I think that's pretty cool. I mean, that it's a subset of cells in a specific part of the brain that can do that. I think that's what we learned. Um, and there has to be something that's happening to those subset of cells, as you said. As you said, because the controls that they've done suggest that you can't just randomly activate this the insular cortex and it'll do this um so the specificity is where i'm what i'm quite interested in but what that specificity encompasses in terms of like they're claiming they're making this big claim that it's it's actually immunological inflammatory Mm -hmm. uh information where i'm not convinced about that but i would say just i unfortunately have to run to a faculty candidate seminar but this point is uh, is an interesting one because the whole field of optogenetics and and these these uh, chemical genetic approaches to activate cells in the brain um, kind of revolutionized neuroscience in one way because now you've got these causal experiments. So X equals you know Y because you activated the, that that set of cells. Um, but what did we learn? And I think you know if you go and look through all these optogenetic papers. I would say 80 to 90 percent have just confirmed what we knew already about, you know, circuits and um, other other sorts of, um, you know, brain region studies based on lesions and other other sort of cruder. So, so I I kind of like this idea of saying, okay, well, n- what do we actually do to learn using these techniques other than the fact that they're fancy and they're 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 more specific. And I, I think that I think that you that you guys convinced me that we learned something more than what we had with these crude lesion techniques. But I think that that's always important to show that like that this paper didn't discover immune conditioning. This paper didn't discover the role of the insular cortex in control of the immune response. Right. Um, and I think that I think that sometimes we lose sight of that when we see these cell papers using opto and chemogenetics that that, oh, they discovered the behavior. But many of these things were shown before they've added a piece to that, which is organ specificity. But but it's not it's not brand new, and I think that that's always important to know. But uh, a lot of those immune conditioning papers done. I looked up like some of the old references. It's all done in like Soviet Russia, um, so it's <laughs> like highly obscure. It's all like you know like um, part of like the Pav- Pavlovian conditioning school. Um, and with this paper, maybe something um, it will become a little bit more mainstreamed, and people would start looking into it more. And I just want to. I don't know whether we have time, but I just want to quickly shout out. Uh, a recent TWIF called Twi- uh, Tree Man Syndrome, where they talk about hu- uh, human papilloma, papilloma virus. Um, and it's talking about like w- with some certain immunodeficiency, you can, uh, the, the warts can turn into trees. But at the end, Rich Condit had a pick, uh, which is an, asset, an essay by Lewis Thomas, uh, which is a, sci- a physician, also science writer, where he talks about uh, back in the, like, this is like written 50 years ago. 
people who have warts, uh, which uh, the, the essay is called On Warts, and people have warts. Warts are caused by a human papillomavirus growing on the skin. If you have warts, 100 years ago, the way you get treated is that someone would hypnotize you and your warts would go away. <laughs> and apparently, you can, uh, you can hypnotize someone and tell them to make the warts go away on just <laughs> one side of the body and it would work. So this has not been followed up. This is all like very, you know, it's hyp hypnosis is not, uh, right now it's not a very well studied branch of neuroscience. But that screams... Uh, some sort of neuroimmune connection, if true. Nice. Um, so this kind of paper, like if if this kind of paper suggests that it's actually a road to doing an animal model of things like that. And when I first heard about that, like years ago from like old Twiff, I was like, there's no way people would figure it out in my lifetime. <laughs> but after reading this paper, I'm like, maybe we will have a mouse model of hypnosis and warts on one side of the body. I think we're going to learn a lot more about how the brain can affect the immune system. And, and you know, we always have these anecdotal things about, oh, stress causes, you know, chronic changes and in, 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 in inflammation, inflammation and that sort of thing. And yeah, we're going to find out yeah. how these things like for work. Example, like, for example, um, autism is linked to GI malfunction, uh, dysfunction and same as Parkinson's disease. And people are thinking maybe some sort of environmental factor in the gut can can drive the things like this, but with this paper, it could just be in the court, like in the brain, causing GI malfunction. And GI malfunction is just the secondary symptoms and not actually the cause. Or maybe there's some feedback. But yeah, I think this this is why this might be important. Ori. I'm gonna sign up, Vincent. I can just leave, right? And it doesn't you won't die. I wanted to ask um, if we if this is correct, and it it uh, still needs more work. So. Well, two questions. What's the mechanism? How does the nerve impulse turn on? Thank you. That was, kind, that was right? my question. It was, can you map out for us either like physical connections, you know, like where axons are projecting, et cetera, and then potentially like what kinds of, I don't know, factors, neuropeptides yeah. or cytokines are being commu are communicating between the neurons and whatever yeah. other cell type is I mean, I think that that. that I think that that has been worked out downstream of the insular cortex that, for example, like there's um, cholinergic or, or adrenergic innervation of, for example, like lymph nodes and spleen uh, and the spleen um, that then releases these neurotransmitters and many B and T cells or, and other leukocytes have the receptors for these, for these neurotransmitters. Um, so I think that that is kind of the hand wavy mechanism at the, um, at the distal organ, um, the synaptic connections between the insular cortex and those autonomic nerves, I think is, is also somewhat understood by other people than me. Um, and, and kind of map essentially maps through the brainstem, through the dor dor uh, dorsal motor um, nucleus of the, of the vagus nerve Dors DMV. I don't know what yep. M stands for. <laughs> Department yeah. motor. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> DC, um, so Maryland, think, Virginia area. I think what would have been interesting would have been to to also measure activity in these in this engram, and see if you could kind of think about like how the neuronal activity of the engram um, leads to uh, the immune activation itself. Does it act? Does it correlate with activation of downstream nuclei? Um, and I think it gets back to the point of you know when in the initial experiment they showed activation of many different brain regions, um, and then they kind of tr they make the case that the insula is very important or at least sufficient to drive the immune response, but they don't address what the insula is doing, how the insula connects with the other brain regions, whether the other brain regions are important in any way. And I'm sure that this will come with time um, and certainly uh, will be very interesting to see. The, the, the other question I had was, so what, what would be the advantage of having this kind of control, right? We're, we think that immune responses will happen locally, right? There's, innate responses, inflammatory responses are at the level of cells interacting with PAMPs, right? And then the, the memory cells and so forth. So what? why have a, another uh, player here involved? So, so if you want to incorporate pain, uh, gastric uh, distension, so how full you are, how hungry you are, how sad you are, um, you have to evoke some sort of central regulator for the immune response, right? So, so 
if we think about the insula maybe as integrating these signals, these interoceptive signals, then it could it could tamp down or activate the immune response based on those other properties or other states. Um, and I think that I think that you know there's a there's a literature that it was referenced in this paper by the la- the last name of the guy is Dancer. Um, and I've I really enjoy his his work on sickness behavior and um, this behavior is essentially or this kind of study is of animals when they're sick will isolate they'll eat less um, and what kind of the neural circuitry is of of this behavior that happens when they're sick and the evolutionary advantage right is that they isolate away from the group so if you're sick with COVID and your brain tells you to go lie down in your room by yourself, you're not going to spread your COVID to everyone around the campfire. Okay. <laughs> right, but apparently it doesn't do that very well. That yeah, apparently exactly. there's exactly. asymptomatic spread at yeah, the beginning. Where- but I think, that, I think that that illustrates the point that you can imagine a situation where I'm really hungry, I eat something, it, it's causing me to have an immune response in the gut, which is going to lead to less or more absorption. Mm-hmm. But it, I would want to modulate that based on my kind of nutrient state, uh, whether I'm sick in some other way um, and, or whether I'm tired, um, et cetera. You know, this is making me think of that <clears throat> a book called How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett or Barrett Feldman. I can't remember which name comes first. But um, for listeners out there who might be interested, it's a very uh, easy and good read. And it's uh, about the connection between like your, how emotion is a manifestation of like your body sensors. So sensing whether you're sick or hungry, or if there's an imminent stress or something like that. So I think putting, you know, reading some of that and getting its thesis in your head, and then maybe coming back and reading it, this reading this paper would probably be really enriching. Yeah, very interesting, very um, thought provoking, and I, I presume that people are going to investigate this more, right? I, yeah, do you what, think? Do you think I can zap my if I have irritable bowel syndrome? If I just zap my insula via <laughs> that's right, like a trans transcranial magnetic stimulation, it would it would be better. But only the engram that encodes whatever stress that you're stressed. Oh, about. you're right. But if I yeah. but do you think so, if you I mean, zap that, enough. Well, that well, but that they tried that here, and they if if they zapped the whole insula, it didn't happen. They didn't the zap the whole insula. Though. They well, zapped they like z- some portion, like a, a controlled amount. I see that was equal to what yeah. the engram. It was. It was actually two times equal, but it's still not the whole insula. Yeah. But I guess I guess the question is, you know, I these papers are really exciting. I think there's always this idea of like, oh man, if we could manipulate the engram, we'd be yeah, that's we'd be the in business. proof of the pudding. I would say, but <laughs> in some ways, that this actually makes me more hesitant to believe that this is translatable because how could you only stimulate the engram right now right it's easy to slam an electrode in the subthalamic nucleus and have dbs it's much harder to genetically capture an engram that's rec- that's like leading to a phenotype in a human yeah which might also drift it's gonna change right, exa- yeah. exactly exactly with every single flare-up so I think that it's helpful in understanding the mechanism of memory, but less so in terms of how we can manipulate it ourselves. Thanks, Ori. My yeah, pleasure. Thanks, Ori. It was good to be back. So Exercise that's twin, with- uh, twin number 26. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash twin. If you want to send a question or a comment, twin at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us. We're a 501c3 year contributions oh, to tax deductible. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Ori Lieberman is at the University of California, San Francisco. Ori Lieberman on Twitter. Thanks, Ori. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, guys. Good to catch up. Jason Shepard's at the University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. He's gone, so he can't say you're welcome. <laughs> Tim Chung is at New York University. A stone's throw from the incubator. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Ari. Thanks, thanks, Vivian. It was a very fun paper to read. And Vivian Morrison's at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you so much, guys. It was super interesting. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You're listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. <laughs> <laughs>